All right, welcome, Michelle. I would like to start off by saying who Michelle is and give you a wonderful introduction. With over 25 years of experience in media, Michelle is an internationally recognized model, television personality, master of ceremonies, speaker, entrepreneur, and philanthropist. She started her international modeling career at 13 and went on to win Miss Universe title in 1992 at the age of only 19 for Namibia. The same country was hosting Miss Universe that year as the year that I won, Thailand. <laughs> Well, Michelle is, I would say she's probably one of the most recognized philanthropists in all of Miss Universe title holders. She was even presented with a Lifetime Achievement Award by the Miss Universe organization in 1998. She's the founder of Michelle McLean Children Trust, which she established in Namibia in 92. It has initiated and run hundreds of projects over the past 26 years, including 10 projects for international celebrities like Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt. The Michelle McLean Primary School provides education for over 900 children every year since 2000. In addition, she established the Michelle McLean School of Excellence, which provides scholarships and entrepreneurial and financial skills training to thousands of students. And now, Michelle, you're also the founder and president of Star Academy, pageant and modeling success coaching. Michelle mm -hmm. offers seminars in person and online and one-on-one -on -one coaching, as well as workshops for confidence building modeling and beauty competitions. Star Academy provides presentation skills and training with Michelle herself in person, preparing each client with the best chance of winning on stage, in the interview room, and in life. Wow, we have so much in common, winning in life, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, but you, you're, you're a couple of years ahead of me there with all your inspirational work and the books that you've published, and I feel like I should be interviewing you. <laughs> Oh, no, I mean, I think this is not really an interview. This is going to be more of a, a talk and a discussion and sharing of ideas because I feel ever since we've met each other, I think it was back in 2008 when we went to India together. I feel like we've had so much in common in so many areas of our lives, right? We have, absolutely. Um, just, just the idea as well that, you know, we, um, I think... If I if I remember correctly, you were quite a reluctant beauty queen, kind of like me in the beginning. Like, what was beauty pageants all about? And and so we kind of stumbled into this industry. But um, and then with this beautiful platform, we've been able to do incredible things: inspirational, motivational speaking, and and so forth. So that's so. right. And let's tell our viewers actually the reason how we met was through. I don't remember the organization name, but I remember it was something to do with cricket and the N ILP or something. Yes, I the IP I IPL. IPL. Yeah. IPL. <laughs> <laughs> so I was actually approached, um, IPL being like, it's a religion, I mean, cricket's a religion in India. So I was approached to find inspirational women to go around and travel with the groups, with the tours, because most of the teams were owned by celebrities in India. So the, the, not only is it a big game, it's also owned by celebrities. So they wanted high profile women. So they asked me to approach a couple of former. Natalie, you were the most courageous out of all of them and Dianara as well to come to India with me and travel. It was quite grueling. You've traveled every single day to a different city in India and it's not a small place. Um, going to these various games um, and working with MTV and um, YouTube. So it was high profile, it was great, but it was, it was definitely hard work. I, re I remember you agreeing with me. It's like, oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> and thousands yes. of fans in the, in the, yes. um, uh, you know, in the different uh, arenas. It was crazy. Well, the, the hardest part for me was living out of a suitcase and just having to get up and go and go and go every time, just pack and go to the airport or drive. And we would have all of these events in the evenings where we hosted the after parties for these games. And then the next morning we'd have to be up at 6 a.m. to travel somewhere else. So that was completely <laughs> exhausting, but so much fun. And the best part about it was meeting you and connecting to you. And look at this beautiful friendship so many years later. I think what, more than 10 years now. Yes, yes, it has been. And, and I'm, I'm just so grateful. And I've just been following everything that you've been doing. 
And um, when I was in Bangkok recently for the Miss Universe pageant as a judge in 2018, you had your book launch. And it was just so amazing to see, um, you know, the, the Thai people are just such beautiful, beautiful people. Obviously having one there, I'm, I'm biased. Um, <laughs> but, but I have to say, being back in Thailand and seeing, just, just seeing how you've inspired so many young women in, in Thailand and how they, they were just so um, incredibly excited about the Miss Universe pageant being back there in, in 2018. Um, done a great job, Natalie. Wow, you've kept the name of Miss Universe really high, you know, confidently beautiful. That's what it's all about. Thank you, Michelle. It's such an honor coming from you, from somebody who's been successful in so many areas of your life and just reading your accomplishments and your bio, I was just, I couldn't believe how many things you have done. That's incredible. <laughs> And how was it to be a judge and to come back to Miss Universe stage as a judge this time, back in 2018? It was actually scarier than it was competing. I was so terrified of being a judge because I think when you are competing, you're putting your own destiny out there, right? You, you're saying, you know, universe, uh, I'm, I'm opening up to you. Uh, I'd love to win. Uh, I've done all the hard work. But when you're a judge, you know that you're actually putting someone else's destiny in your hands. And I took it very, very seriously. Um, in fact, <laughs> my sister was with me on the, on, the, on the trip. And she said to me the one day, she said, Michelle, you, you've got to actually rather just try to enjoy the process because you can't worry about all the different elements. They, they're seven judges. So, you know, it's not just going to be your um, opinion that's going to matter, but mm -hmm. I did take it very seriously. Um, it was wonderful being back in Thailand. I couldn't believe that people still remembered me. And, um, sure. you know, I, I, I just loved it. And, and sharing it with my sister was really, really um, special because my family wasn't there when I won in 1992. And um, I've always just said to them, the culture and traditions and everything in Thailand just... Um, still resonates with me so much. Wow, so all of those years later to come back and experience that with your sister, how special that is indeed. And can I ask you a question about behind the scenes with judging? Because I think it's different now. Back in the day, it was a judging panel that had the scores and everything was transparent and laid out in the television screen, what score that each judge put. But now they call it a selection committee. So it's a completely different approach to judging, isn't it? So what's the difference between then when we competed and now? Well, firstly, in my year, it's the first year that we had an all women panel of um, a selection committee, um, probably for over 25 years. So we were, it was almost like um, really a, an, an unbelievably unique experience to just be a panel of women, to not have any outside commentary from you know from men mm -hmm. um i i think that having having a selection committee these days is not that different from from the judging committee but it's i think the term is it's much more modern in in the sense that mm. a selection of the finest qualities of a woman as opposed to a panel of people judging someone's qualities Mm -hmm. I like that, you know, selection committee because it, it really is, it could be anybody's, any woman's time that night. It, the mm -hmm. stars have to align. You can do all the hard work, as you well know, Natalie. Uh, the skills development, the walking training, the interview training. But really, do we know, um, you know, what's going to happen on the night? It could be a different panel of judges for a different, you know, I mean, could be different backgrounds that that the that the, the, the selection committee have that you know that will will choose and decide on a winner. So okay. So another mm -hmm. question that most ladies who are competing in pageants right now would like to know is if it's a selection committee, do you then discuss and all agree on who should be the winner, or is it still an individual choice of you as a as a judge, as your personal opinion? Just repeat that question. Sorry, it just went quiet there for a second. I think we're having internet uh, maybe problems or disconnection. So the question is, is it when you are selecting the winner as a selection committee, you discuss it amongst 
the all of the judges who will be the best for the crown or is it still an individual choice that all the and you assign a score and then everything gets added up and kind of the average gets taken of that and that determines the winner that is very critical to know is that the selection committee are not allowed to discuss any choices with each other from um, this was the first year as well not only was it a woman uh, a panel of women um, selection committee but we did the preliminaries as well as the final so usually they have different judges for the preliminaries and then they choose another selection committee for the final but we were able to see the whole process through which i think is much more valuable because you really do get to see the full potential of the young woman. Um, and at any stage in that process, we are not allowed to be sitting around discussing it with each other. In fact, we were so isolated in our hotel, uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't go out, we couldn't see anybody. And, and anybody who approached us in the hotel lobby or, or downstairs when we were having coffee, we would have one of the Miss Universe organization representatives come up and say, unfortunately, you cannot speak to them, just in case they were family or somebody that wanted to know, you know, who we had chosen. But it was so, it was very regulated. And wow. it was great <clears throat> that as a selection committee, we weren't going to be discussing um, each and every young woman uh, because as, as the stages progressed, um, you saw different levels of uh, abilities come through in these women from the preliminaries right through to the final. Even in the last moments, I was absolutely gobsmacked, surprised mm. by some of the young women that didn't really stand out in the preliminaries. But towards the end, they just, I don't know where they got that from, but they just shone. Um, I call it universal grace. I call it like, you know, it's like when the stars align, it's just your moment to shine. Um, and you've obviously got to tap into it. And I know that Natalie, you, you believe in that very much so as well. Um, but it, it was just interesting to see. Um, you, you could never be 100% sure who was going to walk away with the crown. That's right. So were you surprised that Katriona won? I wasn't surprised because everything was in her favor in terms of her preparation, her experience, um, and once again, she just flowed. She just, and um, just remember that evening gown, right? She just, she was like lava. She just like melted down the runway, you know, and melted That's into our hearts. <laughs> she was definitely channeling that uh, element of fire, right? Definitely. This is something that I, it came to me in a dream a few days ago. I wanted to create a bonus module for my course, Win the Crown, how to tap into an element of your choice, whether it's water, fire, air, or earth, and really take your presentation and your competition to the next level to become the force, right? Whether it's air, right. water, fire, or earth, and then just be able to tune into that element and then design everything from your personal brand to your walk, to your gown, to your message that you want to share with the world. Okay. And everything is going to be based on that element. Isn't that Fun. That's powerful. So, so you're saying you chose the element of fire? So my, I think my element when I competed was the element of air. Because after analyzing and looking at everything, I felt very happy, positive, open-minded, uh, very talkative and just friendly. And I think that those are the qualities of air. Plus my dress was very flowy. It was white. Yes. So, yeah, but if you look at all of the winners, I actually made a list today and I took a look at the past 20 years to see who was which element. And you can see definitely Catriona was fire, right? Zosie Beanie, the one who just won from South Africa, she was earth. I yes, guess. yes. <laughs> right? And then there <laughs> people like Pia, who was more water, right? Like very demure and uh, sensual. And then you have all the other winners that really they have their, sometimes there's a crossover. What do you think your element was? Oh, I, I, I think it could have been a combination of fire and earth. Yeah. I was very, very down to earth, very grounded, not expecting anything out of that, you know, th that evening to win at all. However, there was an internal fire in me. It was just this passion for, if I get given this opportunity. In, fa in fact, because I was such a dark horse in the race or 
um, you know, the black sheep really. Nobody really spoke about me until I came into the top 10. Then everyone was like, wow, where did Namibia come from? <laughs> I, I think it was kind of that um, earthiness about me, like, oh, well, I'm here now. I might as well do something about it, you know, it's just take right. the opportunity. And that's when the fire kicked in. Um, you know, my years of training and modeling, but also my desire was, was like, if I get given this opportunity, this is going to be fantastic. You know, I get to do so much for the children in Namibia. And so, yeah, I think it was a combination. I think wow. you're right. And you but I remember you when you won, and I definitely remember you being there. It was like you were floating and ethereal and, it, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> I can, not, not floaty floating in the back, right? <laughs> not floaty as airhead, but <laughs> floaty as in all-encompassing. Just yeah, yeah. That's so sweet. Thanks, Michelle. You were there in the audience that night. I remember. I was. I was rooting for you. <laughs> All right. So let's get into the meat of our discussion today, and we'll come back to pageants later. And I know a lot of girls watching they want to find out as many tips as possible from two Miss Universes talking about having a winning mindset, how to deal with pressure, and I think that's the theme for today that we have chosen is how to deal with pressure how to deal with stress under pressure, right? So my first question to you is, do you think that the contestants who are competing in pageants now are facing more pressure these days than they used to when you and me competed? I definitely think so. And the reason why I say that, and it seems very obvious, but the, the intensity of social media and the fact that in our, certainly in my day, 28 years ago, um, I mean, when I won, I had to send a telefax to my parents. Not, not even, you know, there weren't emails, there weren't, um, you know, phones where you can message immediately. So you were almost given like breathing space, a bit of time, even when we had interviews with the media. Um, we sat down with the press, we had interviews on television. It was, there was a certain pace to it. Now it's frenetic and it's instantaneous. And you have got to have such a clear vision for yourself, I think as a title holder, as an influencer, as a model these days, because one slight, it's like being on the right spiritual track, one slight little movement can make this whole shift in your entire life. And that's what social media is now for everybody, is that, um, there's no more leeway anymore. You, you have to, have to um, know that, that you've got to be on the ball all the time. And, and so that creates more and more pressure, I believe. That's right. I couldn't agree with you more. And also another aspect of the competition now that they didn't have before is the girl's platform, the girl's profession, her career, right? Because watching those old pageants, I mean, older than us, much older, like from the 60s. <laughs> with the days. big puffy hair. <laughs> yeah, those ones. I just came across one video where Miss Grease won and she was walking and her introduction was, she's a model, you know, and that was the only thing she could say. She's a model. She has brown eyes and brown hair and her measurements are so-and-so, right? So that was pretty much the only thing that they could say about the girl. So there wasn't so much pressure to try to you know, excel academically or, you know, be super ambitious in your career, right? You, you could just be a model and you could do really well. But now it's not enough. You have to be a career woman. You have to be educated. You have to have a message. You have to be, have a platform and you have to be a role model for thousands, millions of people around the world for young women, right? So I feel like there is a lot more pressure now. Well, I think uh, you just, you put the, you hit the nail on the head there. The expectations are such now that women are expected to be um, this great career person and good in the media and, you know, beautiful as well and strong and physically fit and healthy. So that, all those expectations on a woman, yes, it starts to add up the pressure. But I, I do believe when we get into the discussion about how to deal with the pressure and the stress, it is all about self-awareness. It is all about knowing that comparisons, and especially because of social media and the demand and expectation on us, 
it's probably going to be one of our biggest downfalls um, and has been mine and has, you know, I've, I've gone through life in certain phases and I've had to work through that because I'm human. I will go through this comparison of someone's more successful than me. Someone, you know, um, has a, has a better lifestyle than me. It's, it's crazy. So we need to manage that. We need to manage that. And let's get into how we can manage it because you have some tips for us. In fact, this is one of your methods that you've developed and a big core message and principle that you teach in all of your keynote speaking and your coachings, right? So um, let's talk about that. You have a method called GREAT, which is an acronym, right? So tell us about this method and how it can help us to deal with pressure in pageants or in life, in our work, in our careers and everything else. So I started with my husband as a motivational speaker when we moved from South Africa to America. And we would give this talk great, the acronym meaning um, G for gratitude, R for reframing difficult situations, E for energy, obviously making sure we're healthy and, and happy, A for articulate, using quality, kind words that empower us and don't break us down, and T for teamwork which was really all about whether it's your family, whether it's your work environment. Um, and we, we would do these motivational talks to business people. Um, and I just realized from all the motivational talks I was doing that I was, we were reaching people later on in life, like how to deal with the fact that gratitude um, as an actual technique to do a few times a day or reframing difficult situations, um, they both give off a naturally produced hormone in the body. So it's not just an Oprah Winfrey happy moment where you sit down and you write your gratitudes in a diary, but gratitude, when you are going through the process of whether it's being grateful for your health, something new in your life, the smile of a child when you walk past, just being grateful every day and being aware of it releases dopamine in your body. And dopamine works against the cortisol and the adrenaline in your body, which is built up over time because of the stressful lives that we live. Um, we are unable to, I mean, in days gone by when we were chased by wild animals or we, we were you know, frightened of other tribes, that was once every couple of weeks or days. But today we wake up every single day and we start our day with our phones, social media, the phone rings, we've got the bank manager on our case, we got um, our, our kid um, is not feeling well and can't get to school. So we have so many stresses that build up in our, in our systems that we have high levels of adrenaline and cortisol that actually make it impossible for us to function at our optimal level. So getting back to these techniques and not going into too much detail because I mean, it's a whole hour, you know, sort of a, a, a keynote speech, but the simplicity of these techniques and, and you also um, teach the, the, the power of gratitude. So gratitude releases dopamine reframing situations, not changing the facts because that's delusional. So if you have a difficult situation, you look at it from a different perspective and you see it um, in the light that maybe something else will come out of it. Um, I know that it's, it's so, so cliche, but when a one door closes, another one opens. But finding practical ways in which you can deal with it. Each time you do that, you reframe you're actually releasing serotonin in your body, which is a natural calmant. That's what people usually take um, antidepressants for, but you can produce it in your own body. Um, and I just find these scientifically medically proven um, hormones that are released in your body, just an incredible, an incredible opportunity for us to use, especially when you're younger in life and especially when you're dealing with pageants at any high level stress situations or when you're in the public eye um, you know then getting back to to the other um, parts of the techniques um, so ease for energy obviously the more you exercise uh, more endorphins in your body it releases the stress um, we all know that um, a for articulate now let's be honest I I get down on myself every day they, they are things I say to myself I wouldn't say to another human being like, oh, you're so stupid, you didn't get this right. Or, 
And that, as, as we well know, as, as coaches, have a huge impact on the way that you actually go out and start your day or that you address a situation um, or, or just your perspective on life. So the power of your words, um, articulate what you're saying. And, and that releases serotonin as well as oxytocin. And that's also medically and scientifically proven. So if you're in a group of people um, and, and you're actually saying to somebody else something kind, you're not being dishonest, but you're saying, you know, I really like the way you handled yourself in this meeting, or I can't believe that you could stand on stage. You're so courageous. That releases oxytocin in that person feeling, wow, so good. But it also releases oxytocin in the person saying it and the people witnessing it. So can you imagine the power of positive things if there are thousands of people watching an important interaction between two people that's positive? So I always just, you know, for, for the great principles, I find that to be one of the most important things as well. And then, of course, T for team. We need to make sure that our relationships with our family, with our friends, and the people we work with are positive, positive interactions. Um, and, and that brings everything together. Yeah, because all those positive interactions, again, release a lot of positive hormones, just like the ones you mentioned, like serotonin, the endorphins, the oxytocin, and all of those wonderful things which of course, as you mentioned, they cancel out the effect of the hormones, the, the stress hormones, like cortisol and what's the other one that we don't want? Oh, the, the adrenaline, adrenaline, adrenaline and cortisol. Right. Because as people <laughs> know, adrenaline and cortisol is going to, over time, is going to cause burnout. And I've actually suffered from adrenal fatigue myself in the past, and I know exactly how it feels. And sometimes you're not even just doing anything too stressful but it's the overthinking that causes yeah. this burnout because our minds are so powerful they drain our energy don't they yes right. especially with the, with the negativity i mean there's so much research being done that it actually is takes more energy for us um in our day um if you think about when we go to sleep at night we mostly think about all the negative things that have happened to us um, and we focus our energy on that because we have a natural reaction to negativity. It came from the caveman days when we had to survive. We had to think of what would happen to us. So, but now it's compounded. So we're only thinking about negative things. It takes six positive things to whack out one negative thing. So we need to keep at it. <laughs> do it. And over time, if you practice the suggestions that Michelle teaches in her courses, as well as my courses, you will know that how to change those habits in the subconscious mind because you might be able to say the positive things, but the subconscious mind is still running a tape that's based on those preconditioned patterns and they're still negative, right? So it's even yeah. programming your subconscious mind as well. But I absolutely love what you're saying about gratitude, about reframing and about awareness. Those are really the key first steps for anything, for healing, for transformation, for change, for all of those things that we you know, what, that we want to succeed in life and pageants and our careers, whatever it is. And even in love too, right? Gratitude is the number one quality. I mentioned in my book, I'm winning. And that's for the same reason. It's number one. If you can't be grateful, how can you possibly be a winner? And so, you know, yes. can I just share a story about my experience in this universe? And I would love to hear yours, but I felt so grateful for the opportunity to be there that even when I had to wake up in the morning and be the earliest to rise, because I was always put in the early group, in the early risers group, it was like 4 a.m., <laughs> 30 a.m. or something crazy like that. Even despite all of that, and I love to get my good eight hours of sleep, I still felt so grateful for the fact that I'm living out my dream, just being at Miss Universe, just being able to compete at Miss Universe and be able to tell my grandchildren one day, hey, your grandmother once competed in Miss Universe. So that was like my biggest goal. So gratitude really got me through a lot of these tough times. I went through also some traumatic experience when I chipped my tooth. It was like a little chip, but it really affected my confidence for some time. And I felt, oh, how am I going to win if I have a chipped tooth? But then the gratitude, I just kept, kept coming back to it and being grateful for the Thai people's hospitality, 
for the way that the organization was taking care of us, for all the chaperones, for all of the contestants that were giving me their positive vibes. And I was just acknowledging everything. And I just felt so warm and fuzzy on the inside that everything else negative that happened, it just rolled off my back, <laughs> you know? So I think gratitude really helped me to not only enjoy my experience, go through some negative, mm, I guess, hap things that happened, but also I think it helped me to win. Yes. Yeah. So, can you I, I would imagine hurt? most things, definitely. Yeah. So what about you? Did you use gratitude in your pageant journey? I did. I, in fact, I was going through, you know, firstly, I got to the Miss Universe. I just wanted to ask you quickly, are you still on live on, on Instagram? We are oh, not because it was crazy feedback and people couldn't hear us. So oh, okay. it's better. <laughs> okay. I was just wondering if I had lost you there. But, um, so I, I had... I had to represent my country. You know, some countries are too small to have two separate pageants. So you don't have a Miss Namibia universe pageant and a Miss Namibia Miss World pageant as some countries do. So the winner goes to sometimes both pageants. In my year, I had to go to Miss World before I went to Miss Universe. Wow. I went to Miss World in, we went to the Miss Universe, I went in May of 92. So I had to go to the Miss World in, in December of 91. And I didn't have the best experience. Um, it, was a, it was a very difficult competition. They were in transition. We were stuck in Atlanta in a hotel somewhere. Um, and I just, after that experience, I, I came in the, in the top four. I just said, you know, I don't think pageants are for me. Uh, I don't like the way it's operated. And, but by the time I got to the Miss Universe pageant that May, um, I had decided I'm just going to go there. I'm just going to have fun. I'm going to really learn about the culture, enjoy all the different women that I, you know, to correspond with and network because that's going to be great for the rest of my life. Whether I win or not, it's going to be fantastic. So with that attitude of gratitude and with that understanding that I was just there to really maximize the experience. And like you said, just be so grateful for the opportunity. I just really relaxed into it. I had a few hiccups along the way because my boyfriend at the time was kind of breaking up with me um, while I was there, um, seeing other women, and I was hearing that from friends, and I was just, I was heartbroken and kind of was like, wow, you know, I'm going through a really difficult time and he can't be supportive. Um, obviously, when I won, it was, oh yes, I'm back in your life. <laughs> Right. Uh, he was, and he was for five years. So um, it's, it's just, it was an interesting journey. So having um, the, the ability to have skills like that, um, I didn't have all of them at once. I didn't have the great principles to utilize, but at least having gratitude and at least knowing um, to say kind, positive words to yourself, to motivate yourself, you know, those those techniques worked. So, but now, I mean, if we, if we could offer what we do in the terms of techniques for these young women dealing with pressure at, you know, such a young age, and they're able to help themselves cope better in life from a younger age, um, can you imagine what they can, what they can achieve in life? That's right. Well, ladies, if you're competing in a pageant and you're listening to this interview, please take note that gratitude, reframing, energy and um, then we have articulation speaking it out right and team are so the five ways that you can be using these tips to deal with pressure and for anything that happens i think reframing be the queen of reframing right i have a friend who is another uh, life coach i call her the queen of reframing because she just can take any occurrence or any event or any thought, and she can skillfully reframe it so well that you just look at it and you're like, how did you just do that? <laughs> right? So learn to be the queen of reframing because that is the only way that you can deal with unexpected situations, with things that happen by accident, right? Or sometimes even just unprecedented events, right? So it's, it's yeah, really like important. Okay, you, you're 100% right. But like anything in life, it takes practice. You can't just suddenly go, oh, I'm just going to reframe something. It takes practice to keep at it, um, you know, to, to have a different mindset 
That's right. Um, you can start small. You can try in daily life. For example, tomorrow you wake up and the first negative thought that pops into your mind or the first thing that annoys you or the first thing that you want to complain about, just try to reframe it. For the smallest thing, let's say your air conditioning broke. I mean, we live in Thailand, so it's hot, right? <laughs> and how can you reframe that? So I can definitely complain about it and I can say, well, you know, here we go again. And it's really hot and I'm so uncomfortable. Or I can reframe it and say, well, you know what? At least we have air conditioning where so many people don't. And this is just a temporary hiccup. And in the meantime, it gives me an opportunity to go outside and enjoy fresh air. Yeah. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> I just reframed it, right? Or jump in the ocean. It gives you a chance to do that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So there's just always a way to change the lens, switch the you know, perspective, uh, find a different vantage point, and it's like you know, 360 degrees all around one occurrence or one situation that you can always find and take a look at so many different angles. Love it. Very okay. true. So my last question for you is, do you think men or women have it easier dealing with pressure? And do we deal with pressure differently than men do as women? Because I feel that we have many similarities but we also are inherently different in the way that, you know, our cycles are different, our hormonal levels are different, and, you know, our physiology is different as well in some ways, right? So what do you think about this? Do you think that men or women can deal with pressure better or the same or worse? Or what, what's your standpoint? Wow, that's a, that's a hard question because from the experience and the research I've done from working with CEOs of companies and, and taking my five great principles with my husband when we did talks with businesses, seeing the difference between men and women and how they handle it. And then obviously in my coaching, but more on the women um, and, and how they cope with pressure. I think inherent, in, inherently women are harder on themselves about everything in life, whether it's their own potential, whether it's um, how much they can deal with um, being a good mother, a good friend, a great businesswoman. They want to do everything in one day. Like they want to be the best at everything in one day. I think generally I've come across more women like that than not. Whereas men seem to, they will handle big pressure situations quite well because they can almost detach themselves mm -hmm. in um and i'm not saying all men do this i'm not p painting you know the brush across the canvas uh, it's not it doesn't go for everybody but in my experience i see men compartmentalize their pressure whether it's at work or relationship pressure um, i've seen people have an argument leave home and the man's perfectly fine at work whereas the woman's absolutely shattered you know that she had an argument um, so, but do you I, think that in that way, men are suppressing their feelings instead of releasing them, which can also over time build up and cause some physical problems and ailments and manifest itself on a physical level? Because as women, of course, we like to release our emotions <laughs> readily, whereas men, they've been taught that crying and being emotional is not manly enough. So do you think perhaps they're using this technique, but it's not really a healthy way? to cope with pressure? I, I think once again, it's, it's very uh, specific for different people. And also culture-wise, uh, culture in certain cultures, like in a very British environment or, um, you, or maybe a Japanese environment, I'm just using examples that I'm not saying that that is true, but they have a much more suppressed as a male um, um, interaction as opposed to, to, you know, to talking about their feelings or thoughts about their feelings. Um, in other cultures, like maybe South American cultures, they're much freer. Um, Italian guys, you know, are much more expressive about how they feel. Um, so you, you know, I, I think it's, it's also a sign of the times now that we live in because of more and more pressure. I think we mustn't forget that men have got extra pressure put on them these days to, um, to acknowledge 
not just the traditional ways of how powerful women are, not just mothers and nurturers, but also in business. So it's a whole, it's a whole shift for them and a whole new kind of pressure. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously having to worry about, you know, how to, to interact with a woman because you don't want anything to go wrong. You don't want sexual harassment issues. So I feel, you know, because I've got a young, I've got a young man. Um, Luke is 21 years old. So my son often talks to me about the pressures on, on young men in the new society today. Um, uh, the the zenials, as they might call them, are not particularly talkative. They like to interact through social media. And so they're not the kind of people that like to, they, they'll be verbal, but not necessarily personal and approachable. Um, so there's a whole different cultural change. But he, he was just saying that a lot of men are struggling right now. And if they had techniques to deal with the different pressures of how to cope with dealing with women differently, treating them differently, um, respectfully, as opposed to maybe things in the past, um, then maybe it would be easier for them. Um, so, so teaching them these new skills um, and I really do believe the education system needs to ramp up when we're talking about life skills at school and learning real things at school, as opposed to just learning geography and science and maths. And mm -hmm. I think we need to focus on that. We absolutely must. I think that this should be taught in schools and the great principles is a fantastic course in itself that should be introduced to schools around the world. So do you think that both men and women can benefit from the great principles when, when it comes to gratitude, reframing, energy, and the rest? Well, most definitely, because um, although each and every one of us is different, we have different levels of adrenaline and cortisol in our body, the only way you can counteract that is by having the natural happy hormones like dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin. I mean, that's your natural endocrine system in your body. So you need to balance that out. The only way to, to lower stress levels is to have the happy hormones in your body. Because um, that also interacts, you know, that is, is very um, connected to your brain and your brain function. And then the choices that you make. So you, you, you've got to have a happier constitution if you're going to make happier good choices, healthy choices. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, I agree that as far as gratitude and reframing and positive thinking across the board, it's going to help us release those happy hormones for both men and women. But one difference that I've been recently contemplating about is the different cycles that we go through as men and women, because after listening to a podcast on Mind Valley recently from Al Alisa Vitti, who is sort of the queen of uh, the female hormonal cycles and menstruation and working with your menstrual cycle to achieve success and productivity. According to her, well, it's not just according to her, it's not her research, but she has researched it a lot. And we all have the circadian rhythm, both men and women, right? Which goes around the clock 24 hours, but women also have the lunar cycle to deal with, right? So that's the oh, yeah. radiant, <laughs> in radiant cycle. So on top of that, we need to take into the consideration the stage of our moon cycle and where we are in each stage and how we can deal with pressure and stress and all of those things. So for men, for example, which most research shows and only men have been studied, that intermittent fasting and fasting in general and high intensity interval training workouts and all of these intense activities work really well to release stress in men it actually is counterproductive to women. In fact, it damages more for us than it does any benefit. And I know that personally for myself, whenever I do any kind of fasting, if I don't eat for more than five hours, I feel my adrenal glands just, you know, they just get shot. I get burnt out, I crash, and I don't do well, I don't function well. As well as high intensity interval training, it doesn't help me release stress, it actually builds stress. It, it's put so much strain on my <laughs> adrenal glands and releases too much cortisol. So we have to take into the consideration. Brilliant. Yeah. That's brilliant. That information really needs to come out because I've had personal experience as well in trying to do both of those. Um, and, and it didn't work for me either. And definitely with the, the lunar cycle, I mean, I, I practically howl at the moon when it's, when it's full. <laughs> <laughs> 
hold me back. My husband, when he sees a full moon, he goes, oops. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm totally. a little Yes, for sure. And but, but, uh, that's, that's fascinating. So it, there are very clear differences between men and women. And, um, and, and There are, and, but if you think about it, uh, uh, corporate culture is actually based around the circadian rhythm and we're expected to rise up super early and just you know hustle and pedal yeah. and paddle and be productive since early morning but we don't always feel like that in throughout yeah. the month right we have maybe 10 like a week to 10 days where we could feel like that in in the later in the luteal phase when we are already after the ovulation phase maybe when we feel like we can do things but yeah. actually, for, that's why women feel so much more pressure when they're in the corporate environment, don't you think? Oh, no, absolutely. I, I was just thinking that the other day as, as well, is um, if we, when we are ready to work as women, I feel, uh, not saying that men aren't productive, but I feel we can be incredibly productive in a small amount of time. But get us on the wrong footing, on the wrong day, um, you know, even before ovulation, um, you know, just, I'm not able to, sometimes I just don't want to get out of bed. Of course. And, and why shouldn't we be able to, to get more into that rhythm to understand how we work? We don't work in the same way as men. I, I think we would be a much more productive society if we did give those, you know, balances credibility. That's right. That's right. If we take this into the consideration, I think we would have better society and also more productive work culture. So this information needs to be spread far and wide. And I listened to this podcast, yet, podcast yesterday before my own interview with Mind Valley, and I really just blew my mind. I thought, my goodness, I really didn't even stop to think about this, but it's so, so true. And it kind of intuitively, I knew that fasting and all of these intense workouts were not good for me. But I just kept hearing all of these different results from research and from statistics. But what we don't realize is that those statistics and the studies have been done mainly on men and postmenopausal women. So, yeah, yes. yeah we, we need to take into the consideration and work with our natural flow of the moon cycle and tune into ourselves, right? Awareness is always number one, as, it, as we both say, right? Awareness yeah. is key for everything. And comparisons um, that we make, not only on the physical side, not only about not, you know, uh, I'm not saying don't compare yourself all the time. And, and of course you want a bigger house or a, a more ex expensive holiday or, you know, the luxury, whatever. And that's not, it's not bad to want that. I'm saying the comparisons we make as a human being with other people around us is, is so damaging. And we need to be in our own, as you say, in our own, we need to stay in our own lane. The more we do that, the more we focus on ourselves, the more we focus on, and, and not in a negative way, not in a selfish way, but the more we, we just hone in on who we are, we be so much happier and be achieving so much more. And, and I talk for myself. I mean, it's taken me years and I still wake up in the morning and I have to remind myself not to look at social media, not to um, weigh in on my... Um, my, my results and my success for the day based on someone else's success. That's right. um, really, really important. So. But don't you find that as we get older and move into perhaps in our chakra development up towards the crown chakra, I feel that we are developing ourselves further in that spiritual way to truly make our life our own without thinking too much about what somebody else is doing. It, it comes with maturity, doesn't it? That's why I love, I'm yeah. almost 40 and I'm like, I love, you know, getting older because <laughs> these are the things that I didn't even, I couldn't even imagine the things that I know now, I couldn't even imagine in my early twenties or in my early thirties. And it's, it's a beautiful thing, isn't it? I, I absolutely agree with you. I'm two years away from being 50 and I am so excited about this because I really get the opportunity. Um, I was so worried in my twenties and thirties, you know, being the perfect mother, having the, you know, ha having had a baby, what my body looks like and trying to, to do all this stuff. 
And um, even in the last couple of years, you know, trying to be the, the best business person, the most successful, um, the best motivational speaker. Now I'm getting to my 50s and I'm going, how? You didn't do too badly. You know, you've, you've done this, you've done that. Now, what is the next phase going to look like? And will I make it a happy experience? And my husband and I, we laugh every day when we talk about this. It's like, if you have to project who you are in five, 10 years time, and maybe my husband, my husband's a, a lot older than me. Well, not a lot, but he's, he's a little bit older than me. Um, and then we, we retired somewhere sitting on a beach. He'll go, you look back to today when you had to, um, you were on a journey, you were creating a new business and you'll miss that because it is part of the journey. It's part of that process to, um, to be exploring and learning and carrying on. So as long as we keep doing that in each phase of our life, as you say, um, getting older, you care less about what people think. Mm. Um, and, and I was always saying, I heard that before. I was like, that's not true. Surely you get more and more worried the older you get or whatever. But it's true. I can't. Well, I think some people who don't work on their self-development and their spiritual awakening, they might get progressively worse as they get older. But if you are taking steps and you're practicing spiritual awareness, you're practicing yoga, meditation, and you're working on yourself, you know, self-awareness, self-care, self-development, the three pillars of self-love that I always talk about, mm -hmm. then I think when you do get to that midlife point, you actually blossom instead of facing a midlife crisis as some people do. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. It's taking, it's taking those steps. It's making sure we, we can't, you can't build a house without the right foundation tools, without the cement, without the bricks, without what it is. But you need all of that. And, and as you just said as well, your techniques are so, so important for that foundation of your life. Because only, the, only then can you start building on everything else. That's right. I wish I could keep talking to you about all of these incredible insights and ideas. And I think we have to wrap it up by now. So I wanted to say a big, big thank you to you, Michelle, for coming in and sharing your positive vibes, your knowledge, your wonderful, wonderful personality with all of us. And if you would like to follow Michelle, please go ahead and follow her on Instagram, Michelle McLean, right? Michelle and Michelle, yes. Yes, official Michelle McLean official, and of course, you, are you on Facebook as well? Yes, you can see me at Michelle McLean hyphen Bailey. Okay, or, and or do you have a do you have a website? Yes, it's Michelle at Michelle McLean dot io. Okay, oh, wonderful. It's just it's yeah, it's uh, website is Michelle McLean dot io. Okay, so if you are an aspiring pageant contestant, a model a speaker or any performer even please go ahead and reach out to michelle for her coaching which she has group coaching one-on-one -on -one, and many online uh gems as well right you have some courses coming up as well right yes, yes. we're going to be launching some courses towards the end of october so oh, be very that's exciting that's that. exciting well i think we have a lot more room for collaboration between both of our projects because i also of course have win in love win in life win the crown and i'm also launching my course uh actually this month it's coming up win the crown online course which is going to be different than the past that i've done group online coaching and one-on-one -on -one coaching online but this is a packaged course that is very affordable for all of the aspiring contestants so yes thank you so much michelle i can't wait to catch up again and do some work together Thank you. I look forward to it. And for all of you out there listening, Natalie is the most phenomenal coach and amazing woman. So please do reach out to her as well. And thank you for this wonderful opportunity. I've got to see you soon again. I <laughs> know. As, as soon as we can start traveling again, I think we're going to have to make it back to the US. We were supposed to be there now, actually, in October, uh, or sorry, August, September is when we usually go down to Burning Man. So. <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, but it was canceled this year, so I think it's gonna have to be next year. So, well, if you do, I would love to experience that. And we have one in Southern Africa as well. That Africa is burn. phenomenal in the desert. Oh, that is a dream for sure. Have you been there? No, no, I, I haven't go. been to any one of them. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Let's go, Michelle. You're gonna be the perfect person to go with. Oh my goodness, <laughs> sounds good. Oh my. Goodness. 
All right, dear. So I guess uh, I.